Somebody had a drilling machine in the yeah. gardener. I think yeah. nine months of using Teams and Zoom, I've learned all of the dark arts and tricks. <laughs> the recording has started, so you can start, Gunilla, if you want. Yeah, OK. So welcome, everybody, uh, to this webinar on salt tectonics. Uh, this is arranged by the Structural Geology Group uh, in FORCE. And today we're offering three talks on salt tectonics. Uh, all talks are about 20 minutes long with five minutes allowed for questions at the end. And if you want to raise a question, you can either do it by the hand icon up in Teams or um, you just write it in the chat box. So today we're going to start at 12 o'clock uh, with Oliver Duffy. He had an early morning start in Houston. Uh, he's, gonna, he's from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, 12.25, Christopher Jackson from Imperial College London will do his talk and then we'll end up at 12.50 with Gabriela Salomoa Martins from Imperial College London. And I'll uh, just give a short introduction of the speakers here. So I start with the first presenter, so Oliver. Uh, he's a researcher from the Applied Geodynamics Laboratory, AGL group, at the University of Texas at Austin, where he specializes in salt tectonics, focusing on basins worldwide, including the Gulf of Mexico, the pre-Caspian Basin, Kazakhstan, and the North Sea. Prior to this, Oliver was a postdoc at Imperial College London and a PhD student at the University of Manchester. During these periods, he addressed questions relating to how salt tectonics and multiphase rifting have influenced the structural and stratigraphic evolution of the North Sea. So go ahead, Oliver. You have to unmute, Oliver. You're on mute. Oliver, can you unmute? I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Sorry, no, I'll just share again. I'll just share the screen again. Sorry. Yeah. I got. It's off there, sorry about that. Okay, so can, is everything clear now? Yep. Excellent. Okay, Go ahead. so, well, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to get this uh, series of talks. Uh, underway, uh, focusing on salt tectonics. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the aim of this first talk is to provide a bit of a, an overview and as a quite a simple aim, and that is to outline the motivations um, and key questions um, that would be addressed um, and why we think it basically, why we think it's a key time uh, for our renaissance of North Sea salt tectonics. Um, and in particular, uh, taking a fresh look at the late Permian and Triassic salt tectonics of the Central North Sea. So just we'll start off just thinking about some of the kind of broader motivations uh, as to why we'd want to look at Central North Sea salt tectonics again. And obviously we're all here for, for force, so there's clearly uh, an, an importance in terms of hydro, obviously the hydrocarbon industry, and also we know about the North Sea in terms of gas storage. Now thinking about the hydrocarbon province, We've all seen kind of sketches uh, like this in terms of the uh, Central North Sea salt tectonics. So this is one of uh, Chris's figures. And we know that the uh, Zechstein has influenced the Central North Sea. It's in influenced all elements of the hydrocarbon system. And so, you know, the general characteristics are known. However, there are a couple of gaps in knowledge and quite major ones uh, that could lead to some quite significant advances given the right salt tectonic uh, knowledge and the right salt tectonic study, which we're proposing. 
First of all, the Triassic interval um, is relatively poorly understood and underexplored. So if we increase our knowledge of salt tectonics and how uh, the, 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 the Zechstan has influenced uh, the Triassic, we may enhance and improve the ability to develop new player potential in that interval. And likewise, there's been a kind of relatively recent trend uh, for finding some intrazextine discoveries in the central North Sea. So an example of that, well, at least a, a good overview, uh, was presented in the UK sector by Petruno et al. in 2017, who highlighted the importance of some intrazextine cliniform forceps um, in the UK sector. Um, and so again, that's just that's just one example. We also know that there's a lot of deformation going on within the Zechstein itself, and there's it's quite, it's, it's not just pure pure halite. There's lots of uh, lithologies and complex structures within the Zechstein that can be very important from a hydrocarbon exploration uh, perspective. And so again, salt tectonic knowledge of that um, is relatively weak in the North Sea and can be significantly advanced. Um, and that's where we think we come in. Another key motivation is the fact that the Central North Sea at the moment, you know, there's, there's a wealth of data um, as a result of the DISCOS database um, for academic research, which is obviously excellent and it's fantastic, um, fantastic, uh, fantastic for us. So we can see here the outline of the 3D seismic data we have access to as a result of, as a thank you, thank you, thanks to DISCOS. And it's, it's a wealth of data. So we've got great data coverage. Um, in addition to that, the quality of the data compared to when a lot of the salt tectonic key, six, key salt tectonic research was done on the Central North Sea in, in the 80s and 90s, obviously things have improved a lot since then. So if we take one of the key, uh, an example figure from one of the key papers in Central North Sea salt tectonics, this Hodgson et al paper, this is, this is an example of one of the figures they were using. So the seismic is obviously and pretty limited quality. And this is the sort of figure that was used to define some of these pods. Um, now, if we compare that to what's available nowadays, um, we see that we've seen this example from the, the year and high. Um, this is an example from PGS, and we see some quite spectacular imaging here. Um, and it's another world from what was available before. We're starting to see here some alloxin assault sheets. We're seeing these mini basins, these Triassic mini basins, and all sorts of interesting geometries in there that have not been picked apart. Uh, and so there's a, there's a huge area for growth by, by looking at this with fresh eyes. The other thing to consider is that when, when a lot of this key North Sea salt tectonic research was being done, it was, it was done in the 80s and 90s. And since then, there's been an explosion uh, in understanding of salt, salt, salt basins. Um, we've had examples from the AGL in, here, in, here in Austin, uh, which, uh, which, which was formed, was formed in 1988, 1988 and has done uh, 30, 30 years, years of research on this. Uh, and there's also been, obviously, research conducted around the world as well um, and significant advancements. So we do think it's time for a fresh look. Now let's just let's have a quick think about what makes the North, Central North Sea interesting from a salt tectonics perspective. And the first thing to consider here is thinking about the Zechstein unit itself. Now, so this, so we know that the Zechstein is a laid evaporite sequence. Uh, it consists of five evaporite sequences stacked on top of one another. So Z1 at the bottom to Z5 at the top. And there are also some very marked spatial variations in fasces and mobility of the Zechstein, which is really a, an interesting area and a key motivation uh, for some future research. So here we've got a figure that was compiled by Chris Jackson using also some data from uh, Clark et al. in 1998. And you can see from this figure that around the margins of the Central North Sea, you get more carbonate rich uh, fasces deposited. So the greens and blues, so a higher proportion of carbonates in the Zechstein. And that is relatively immobile. In contrast, in the, in the center of the basin and in structural topographic laws uh, where the uh, Zechstein was deposited, you get more basinal fasces, so you get more halite rich fasces. Um, and so there's a clear variation across the basin in, in the mobility of the Zechstein. 
So given that, that's one interesting basis. We also know that the central north sea is interesting in terms of tectonic perspective. If we just outline here that in green, we have the outline of the uh, central north sea salt. We can see also that this is a map here showing Triassic, uh, tectonic activity in the Triassic. And we see we have obviously this you know, extension, the central graben forming and this focused extension uh, along, along Norway. We then have a very interesting aspect. We have the, uh, the North Sea Thermal Dome um, and the so associated dynamic topography, which you would expect with that. And that could have you know, some potential influence on the salt tectonics. And we then have the uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous uh, rifting uh, following the substance of that dome. So what I'd like to do now for the remainder of this talk is now outline uh, uh, some of the key themes that we've identified for future research on Central North Sea salt tectonics. And this, these, these themes will form the basis of a research proposal that we're planning to submit to um, the Research Council of Norway in collaboration with uh, the University of Bergen, so with Rob Garthorpe and Atla Rotevarten, and with uh, Chris Jackson, as well as colleagues here at AGL in Austin. And so just, just, just bear that in mind, and we're looking for industry partners uh, for this research. So just, I just want to, bear that, want you to bear that in mind, um, if that potentially may be of interest to you or your company as we go through these. So the first of these questions, the first of the key themes you've identified is a fundamental one. And that is thinking about how were diapers triggered in the Central North Sea? So in general, probably many of you will be familiar with these two end member models for diaperism in the Central North Sea. So on the left hand side, we have the Rift Raft model uh, of Penn Jatel 1993. And that is essentially a case where the diapers were triggered by extension. So you have initial configuration that looked like this. You then get some extension and you get some weakening of the cover and thinning of the cover. And you get these little diapers forming, uh, forming in the rifts and rafts in between. So this is uh, the rift raft tectonics, and it's essentially reactive diaperism and is inferred to occur largely actually after the Jurassic, after the Triassic in the Jurassic during extension. The other, the other end member model is this pod model of Hodgson et al. And in this case, it's assumed that the density driven subsidence um, is the predominant control uh, on tr triggering diapers. And essentially, it's where you have these these pods subsiding down into the salt and these passive diapers developing in between. Okay, so you've got essentially reactive diaperism and then essentially passive diaperism. But these models, you know, were developed a long time ago and, you know, there may be critiques that can be made given new understanding. I think what's also important to consider is you need to map this out to understand how, the how this is working across the basin. Uh, and Simon Stewart uh, attempted this in 1999, and he, he made a, a really nice comment that it's not like one trigger mechanism is going to be dominant across the entire Central North Sea. So these two models are not, not in competition at all, but they could be occurring at different times in different places across the Central North Sea, given different uh, driving forces, and they may be spatially variable. But this needs to be mapped out, given this new wealth of data we have. Uh, to, and to see what could be causing these triggers, because there are some quite uh, interesting claims um, that other triggers could be coming into play, such as thin skin shortening. Um, and how that maps out across the basin could have quite significant implications for uh, paleogeographies, structural restorations, and just general Triassic and late Permian uh, understanding across and regional understanding across this basin, which, which is lacking currently. The second theme um, is all about salt walls and understanding the, the, the growth, geometry, and evolution of salt walls. Um, just from we, 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 this year, and some of the work we did this year, we picked apart uh, a few seismic cubes in different portions of, of the central North Sea, uh, salt influence portion. And we mapped the top salt. And what was, what was very clear from that was there were distinct variations in the structural style in the salt walls, just across, just a couple, just in a couple that we picked, you can see here that these the salt walls in these three areas are varying dramatically in terms of their length, uh, their height, 
their orientation, the degree to which they're connected. So these are top salt maps. You can see marked variations in height on these, on these walls. And just their 3D geometry is varying significantly. So there is a very fundamental piece of work which is really important and would be really valuable in Central North Sea of asking why, what's controlling this? Um, so how we, how we, how in this project, how we would tackle that? Um, we would use uh, we would use our typical approach of using uh, observations from seismic data. So we've got some examples of some seismically mapped uh, salt walls here from the Central North Sea, and we'd combine that with some physical and numerical models to really get to grips with what's causing um, these very interesting geometries, as you can see here. Some very interesting. This is an example of a natural salt wall. These geometries of the salt walls are spectacular. And we can kind of almost mimic some of these with physical models, which is what we see here. This is a physically modeled example from Tim Dooley. Um, so we would want to ask, ask questions such as, what are uh, the main uh, geometrical styles of salt walls? How have these salt walls evolved? And how can we explain the long and cross strike variability, which is really not accounted for uh, in current models? We've got to think about how salt flows in salt walls. And here we have some example from a numerical model showing salt flow within a salt wall and how that changes uh, in, di in, in different salt walls and in different settings. And think about generally understanding the controls on how these salt walls grow. Now, this quite, the, answering these questions is important um, in terms of thinking about, well, you know, if you, if you can't map the geometry, if you don't really understand the geometry of the salt walls, you're not really going to have uh, good control uh, in terms of seismic imaging and velocity models. Um, you, we know that these salt walls can, can present drilling risks, um, and they may not all be con completely halite rich. You need to understand some, some control on their composition. And of course, the growth and evolution of these salt walls is going to impact um, how your reservoirs and how your, how your sediments were deposited on the flanks of these. Um, so it can really help understand uh, reservoir distribution and trapping uh, near salt walls. The third thing would be thinking more about mini basins in the central North Sea. So here in AGL, we've done a, a cluster of projects really focusing uh, on how mini basins subside and move. Um, and we're focused on the Precaspian Basin and in, in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So we want to take that knowledge um, and apply it to the central North Sea. So just very briefly, we can say that in, in kind of very recent studies, um, we've kind of shown how mini basins can be broken up into different stratigraphic units, which, which can record the subsidence history. Uh, and that can be linked. So here you can see these various units in here. That's recording the subsidence history of that mini basin. And that can be linked to different controls um, on that, on, on the subsidence history, such as you know, extension, uh, base salt relief, and so on. And this has not really been done clearly before. We've also shown how mini basins, they're not isolated isolated features, they interact with one another as they subside and they can, and that's due through pressure gradients in the salt. And this is work that Nara Fernandez did, showing pressure gradients within the salt impacting mini basins. And we've also shown that mini basins are not static. They move through time, particularly uh, on slopes. Um, so in the Gulf of Mexico, we showed how mini basins can get, can interact with base salt relief and can actually be obstructed from translating basin woods, uh, as, or some can be obstructed some can't, and that leads to very interesting uh, stress and strain patterns on the slope and some very uh, wacky geology, uh, without doubt. So as I said, we want to apply this sort of approach to the Central North Sea, and there's some unique characteristics as to why the Central North Sea is important. And the first off, first off, uh, we can, we've can we got, you know, we're getting better imaging of the Central North Sea mini basins, and you can see here an example. We can see some clear stratigraphy uh, within the, the Triassic uh, mini basin, you can see evidence of uh, some tilting of the mini basins, uh, some nice, some nice units there that can be mapped out, and some fascist change. But what's also important is the fact that this is all deposited, uh, depositing across a rift related topography, and that rifting may may well have been ongoing as those uh, mini basins were subsiding. So that's a unique aspect. Quite how those mini basins interact with the rift topography uh, is is unexplored. And likewise, we've also mentioned that the uh, Central North Sea uh, is a layered evaporite sequence. So we want to think about how those mini basins, how they subside through layered salt, 
Obviously, it's not, it's not pure halite, so the mini masons may struggle in some areas to subside and may not in others. And we also want to think about how the, that layering could affect how mini masons move and if they move uh, in the central North Sea. And these questions, again, to us are, are unexplored. Uh, Oliver, you have um, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Oh. So the fourth thing um, all gets on to um, <clears throat> the is all about intrazextine salt tectonics. And in this, the reason why this is important is the, is the layer the zextine uh, is a layer evaporite sequence. And we've seen in from across the across across the globe, we've seen examples where we see spectacular folds and thrusts. Um, and, and an incredible an array of salt tectonic structures uh, within the salt. And that's been put down uh, to having density, strat density uh, stratification within the salt unit itself that can drive this salt tectonics. Okay, so having dense units above less dense units within the salt can drive uh, developed structures like this, which is an example from the Santos Basin. And we think we see examples of that in the central North Sea. And we know the Zechstein is laid of upright. So we actually uh, had a student uh, just do some preliminary work to see uh, if th there, there was um, evidence of this density stratification and if we can apply that to the Central North Sea. And in simple terms, by splitting up the Zechstein into density units, we see that there are areas where we see uh, denser units. This here, is a, here we see an average density of 2.59 within the Zechstein above an area which, has, which is less dense. So we think there is possibility uh, for this, and that could, can explain some of the geometries we see here, so where this is the top of the Zechstein, where we see this complex stratigraphy and structural style in here. Uh, and so that we think this is a, a, an important area to explore and could have a, a lot of impact in terms of drilling hazards and velocity models and understanding um, source rocks and such uh, in so, uh, reservoirs in the Zechstein. Theme five, I don't need to, I don't, I'm not going to touch on because this is something that uh, Chris is going to talk about in the, in the following talk. Um, but this, this will fit in, you, this will become clear when uh, Chris has, has talked uh, following this. Um, but essentially, the, the key element here is that there, there are variations in the Zechstein fasces uh, across the basin and variations in mobility that can really impact to the first order um, the salt tectonic style, uh, timing. Uh, and the geometry of the salt structures that may develop. And we wish to explore that further. So for more information on this, just hang fire uh, uh, for Chris's talk. So then to, to get to getting to the end of this, then essentially what we're trying to do here, ultimately, is to provide the first detailed uh, uh, synthesis of late Permian and Triassic uh, salt tectonics. <clears throat> Uh, so this hasn't been done before uh, in, in detail. Uh, and one of the important motivations um, is that there's an interesting paper by Carlo et al. Uh, in 2014, uh, which proposes this uh, model uh, for the Central North Sea, whereby you, they use salt tectonics to see, uh, to show that perhaps around margins of the Central, Central North Sea, there was shortening. And they suggest that that is a result of basin uplift within the Triassic in the center of the basin. Now, obviously this can have quite significant, is gonna have a huge impact uh, for paleogeographic geogra paleo understanding of the central North Sea and, and structural restorations. And we think with our salt tectonic approach, uh, we can actually get uh, un un unravel uh, and unpick whether this, this model is correct. And we've done some preliminary work which suggests it's not as straightforward um, as they would propose. So that's an important aim for us. And so to conclude, we've seen that the Central North Sea is, we think is prime uh, for uh, a salt tectonic uh, study. We've outlined uh, the different themes that we think that we would focus on. Um, and then we ultimately, we want to get to this Triassic synth and late Permian synthesis. So that's, 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 that's the conclusion. And I'd just like to finish super quickly, um, just to outline one of the key motivations for this talk is that we're trying to submit a research proposal, and I've mentioned uh, the, the premise of that uh, through the talk. And I'd just like to say that we are looking uh, for industry partners uh, to, to work with us on this. Um, and we're looking for two or more industrial partners interested in Central North Sea exploration. And that will be to share 20% of the total funding that we ask for 
from the Research Council of Norway. So, you know, this is a, we've got these preliminary ideas and this, this preliminary proposal, and we're willing to, we're willing to shape that uh, to suit the interests uh, of industry. And we're very happy to talk to, uh, to anyone who, who thinks they may, their company may, may be interested in, in working with us uh, on this project. So please get in contact with us. Here, here are some email addresses, um, and we're happy to talk anytime. So thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And uh, now it's actually time for uh, Chris. Uh, so I don't think we will have time for questions. Maybe at the That's end of all the talks. So if okay. someone has a question, let's save it to the very, very bitter end. Uh, so if you could stop sharing and then Chris, if you could start sharing your presentation. Yeah. So I'll uh, give a short introduction. So Chris Jackson, he worked in the energy industry in Norway before taking up an academic position at the Imperial College. His research focuses on the structure and evolution of sedimentary basins. In February 2020, Chris will move to the University of Manchester to take up a new position as <coughs> Professor of Sustainable Geoscience. Go ahead. So can you see my um, screen? The yes. screen. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, thank you so much, um, Gianella, for giving me another invitation to come and talk at the Force Lunch and Learn. It's always good fun. And even though I'm not there in person, it's Devanga getting lost on my way to the MPD. It's still it's still good to to be here. So, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work we've done at Imperial College, looking at the Egerson Basin, looking at the structure and stratigraphy of this salt influence rift basin. So, I'll touch on well data, seismic data, salt tectonics, and rift tectonics, and um, yeah, so hopefully that'll give you a good overview of the work that was undertaken by this group of people. So Runa Manny and Matthew Lewis, who were two PhD students at Imperial College uh, some time ago. Gary Hampson, who was involved in some of the stratigraphic analysis. Uh, Rob Gawthorpe and, and myself. So where are we focusing on? So the Egerton Basin, to me at least, was one of the new basins. It was one of the things I'd not really looked up when I moved back um, from industry into academia. It's located here off southwestern Norway. Um, it's an important point is it's a salt influence rift basin. So it's located right at the kind of pinch out of the um, upper Permian Zechstein supergroup, which displays varying degrees of mobility linked to varying percentages or compositions of or, or volumes of, of halite within that unit, as Ollie remarked on in his talk. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit in this talk as well. So we had access to a 3D seismic reflection data set provided by PGS, the outline of which you can see in the map here um, and the thin black line. And we had a number of wells, some around the basin centre and some around the basin highs, um, the basin, the kind of basin marginal highs as well. So this is a, a cross section across the basin going from the northeast to southwest. Um, again, there's quite a lot of text in these slides because I you know, we're going to make these slides available to you, so it'll make way more sense in addition with the recording as well with this text on. But the key things I want you to take away from this slide are kind of highlighted in red. Here we are at the northeastern pinch out of the Zechstein. The Zechstein's the pink layer in here and X is defining the pinch out. So you can see we're straddling an area where we go from no salt to some salt. We've got also two main fault populations. We have a subsalt um, or basement involved fault population down in here, which offsets um, lower Permian, Rotligand and older. And then we have a suprasalt fault array as well. So these are faults which are essentially restricted to the Jurassic and Cretaceous and detach out downwards into the upper Permian Zechstein supergroup. So we have those two fault populations and they're going to be important as we go into the next, um, the first kind of main bit of the talk. So what about the tectonic stratigraphic framework? There's lots of names. We like putting names on things. But what I really want you to take from this slide, um, and this stratigraphy will probably be familiar to some people in the audience, is there, are, there were two main phases of rifting, one sort of loosely constrained to syn salt to slightly post salt in the Triassic, and Ollie referred to that in his talk, and then a main um, Jurassic, Middle Jurassic to Cretaceous rift phase. And also a detachment um, generated by that Permian salt layer. We did a lot of work around seismic to well ties. We did a lot of work with the biostratigraphic data in the wells in the in the Egerton Basin. So we devised this relatively 
complex um, age stratigraphic framework, but that was really critical for allowing us to map out both the stratigraphy, which I'll talk about in the second half of the talk, and also constraining the timing of some of the main structural events. And then we tied that with synthetic seismograms to the seismic data, as you can see here, base salt in red, top salt in pink, and then a number of reflections in the um, overburden. So from the top of the Triassic in dark blue, all the way up to near the top of the um, Cretaceous. So let's have a look at the basin structure to start with. Um, and we're going to focus here on something called the Stavanger fault system, which bounds the northeastern margin of the, of the Ugersund Basin. And we can see it's defined by two main segments. There's a fault segment here, which tips out, and there's a fault segment further towards the, the east, which is, in, is kind of north-south striking. And between them, there's a relay ramp. And so there's a base salt map shown here on the left, and then there's a sketch map on the right. If we look at the salt thickness above that base salt, we can see the salt displays variable thickness. There's a diap here along here, so this is a salt wall. There's this area of grey, which is actually what we call a primary salt weld. And then we can see a number of these more stock-like diapers sitting along or just above the um, basement-involved fault. Critically, you can see the pinch out of the Zechstein. I've remarked a few times we're at the northeastern margin, and that pinch out is what I'm tracing out here. It's shown by the red dashed line in the sketch. What you notice is that this salt in the foot wall and hanging wall of this low displacement part of the basement involved fault, but as we go along strike towards where the displacement's greater, the salt is restricted only to the hanging wall, and that's critical for what I'm about to show. And then if we step up to the base of the Sinrif, this is the super salt fault population. We can see the fault is hard linked to the basement in the northeast, oh, sorry, in the northwest. And then we have this thin skin fault population, which swings around um, and is offset from the basement involved fault population. But critically, this fault system here, this thin skin system I'm tracing out, directly matches the pinch out of the Zechstein. So those faults are detaching down into the edge of the Zechstein just as it pinches out onto the Stavanger platform. So that's a kind of compilation showing you all of those structural relationships. <clears throat> so now let's have a look at um, that a long strike change in salt presence and structural style. So as I said, in the northwest, there's only salt in the hanging wall of the Stavanger fault system. There is no salt in the foot wall. And we can see that there's a single thick skinned fault system in blue. It goes all the way through from basement, through the salt, up into the top of the Cretaceous. There's a, you can see the seismic data up there. But if we go only a few tens of kilometers, if that, a long strike towards the southeast, there's a very different structural style. Here we have the basement involved fault in here. Um, is um, is kind of detaching within the salt, just at the base of the Triassic. The salt is present all the way into the foot wall of the uh, fault. Chris, yeah. there is a comment here. It would help if we could see your cursor. You... Is, that, is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. Oh, that okay. Sorry, I can see the arrow, but you can't see the arrow. Thank you. OK, sorry. Um, yeah, so you can see there's one thick skin basement involved system and then there's this thin, there's a thin skin system here in orange, which is detaching, like I said, at the edge of the Zex9 pinch out. And there's that basement involved portion. And there's this beautiful forced fold, we call it, this flexure across the basement involved um, fault. So we can see that fault propagated upwards and cause this folding. And then these really exquisite thickness changes in the sin rift. So if we look at these thickness changes in the Sinrift, and these are two isopacks, so the lower Sinrift isopack is here, and this includes things such as the um, Sandness formation and the Brina formation and the um, Egersund formation. I think it includes the Sauda maybe as well. <clears throat> we can see there's the thickening across the fault, and there's the thinning up onto the monocline. So you can see the depot centre in the lower Sinrift isn't against the fault, it's actually offset from the fault, because the fault wasn't there, it was only a monocline. Uh, above the fault tip. If we look at the upper sin rift into here, so to Thonian through to Albion, a very different isopack pattern in the late rifting. We still have this big across salt thickening in the northwest where the fault was still surface breaching, but now we start to open up these depot centers way back into the foot wall because we've got slip on the thin skinned um, detached faults. 
And so there's a whole story in there about the kinematic link between the basement involved in the thin skin faults, which I'm not going to go into, but it's all in um, Lewis et al. 2013, and there's a bibliography at the end of the talk. So let's just summarise that structural evolution before we move on to the stratigraphy. This is what we think the pre-rift template looked like in 3D. There's the salt restricted to the hanging wall in the northwest. Here's the salt extending into the foot wall in the southeast. And there's the basement involved fault, which we think was there before salt deposition. And again, that's a story um, talked about in a different paper, how we established that. There's the first rift pulse. We can see here that there's a monocline developed along much of the length of the fault. So there's a high relief monocline here in the northwest where the basement fault has greatest displacement. There's a low relief monocline as the fault is starting to tip out towards the southeast towards that relay. But then as we keep growing the faults, the fault breaches the monocline in the northwest. It hasn't breached the monocline in the southeast because the displacement is less. But what we've had is kinematic transfer. We've had the transfer of strain from the basement involved fault back along and through the salt into the foot wall and that triggers stretching of the super salt cover and the formation of these super salt restricted faults. That's why we have this very complex change here because these super salt faults are directly tracking the salt pinch out at the northeastern edge of the Zechstein salt basin. So that's the um, you know, kind of part of the structural story. So, you know, this very close link between the basement involved and the super salt restricted faults and the role of the variable salt distribution, um, the role of variable salt distribution plays on, on that. So how did the stratigraphy deposited during that time beyond the bulk isopacks I showed you for the lower and upper synrift, how did the stratigraphy, or how does the stratigraphy reflect that tectonic evolution? Well, let's focus now on the Brina and Sandus formations, the Brina being what the main reservoir unit really in, um, sorry, the Sandus and the Brina to a less degree being the main reservoir units in the Eggerson Basin. So Aruna looked at this, and this is a simplified stratigraphic column in here with some mapped seismic units in here. These colours will be consistent through the slides. So green is Brina, brown is uh, Sandus and Eggersund, and then we have a number of different reflections in here, which are the J sequences. So this same data set, again, the PGS 3D, um, we focused again, we drew more heavily here on the borehole data, and this map here shows you where we had boreholes with biostratigraphic data, so the kind of pink colours, boreholes with uh, core data, which are the blue colours, and then where we had both of, both the colour together. And then where we didn't have either, we still had thicknesses of the lithostratigraphically defined units. So you can see we had a decent spread of data. We were able to tie that borehole data to the seismic data by making synthetic seismograms. This is just an example from 922. Um, the Brina formation is this unit in here with the erratic gamma ray log in here. It's more heterolithic, whereas the Sandus formation is J20 to J40, so green to blue. And you can see that low gamma ray package is a, defined it as being over sand, overall sandier capped by the Eggersund, which again goes back to these finer grain lithologies. So the Sandus formation here, when it gets quite thick above 80 metres, we can actually map an intra Sandus um, reflection, which is this intra J40A reflection, which is actually defining a flooding event within the Sandus formation. So they're the main two packages and the main reflections that we mapped around. We did a lot of core logging, so we logged all the core. I'm not going to show you any of that today, but we built a fascist association framework here going from offshore um, through to shallow water deposits, upper shore face, eventually down to coastal plain. And so um, that's all documented in a couple of papers by Aruna, that, that fascist analysis. That fascist analysis critically allowed us to build a sequence stratigraphic framework. We define these very thick, 100 meter thick para sequences where we see this upper transition from um, offshore transition deposits up into this orange, which is um, upper shore face, and you can see these flooding surfaces. So we, uh, we have these abrupt transitions back to deeper water fascias, and those flooding surfaces, like I say, allow us to build a sequence stratigraphic framework, which then we can use to correlate between welds. Sometimes we see um, an absence, as we see here, of the coastal plain fascias, and that's maybe because the coastal plain rocks are actually eroded off um, during uh, by wave revement during uh, sea level rise. Other times we do, as you see here, we have upper shore face rocks overlain by coastal plain or coal bearing coastal plain rocks, meaning we have this full regression 
Before then, another flooding event is shown here in purple going back into lower shore face, so lower fort shore face deposits above coastal plain. So there's kind of interesting things as I'll show you in some of the stratigraphic correlations about how those rocks are variably preserved. So let's look at this at uh, the highest level now, regional stratigraphic architecture. This is a big isochron of the J20 to J40 sequence, so the main part of the Somnus. We can see thinning up onto the cellar high. We can see thinning across this Z anticline. We see some local thickness changes around what we call the, the beta salt wall and the alpha salt wall, and, and, and we looked at some of this earlier on. So there are thickness changes at the regional scale when we look at the, the largest seismic scale of the package. We're now going to look at a dip section, so a depositional dip section, which is B to B prime and C to C prime being a depositional strike section to look at the sunness in more detail. So there's a seismic line. Sunness again is in this uh, in this uh, brownie in the green colour here. Brown is then going up in, so it's in the brown in here. Let's check that. And then we have the correlation underneath mapping, which matches this seismic line. You can see this really nice, this depositional dip profile. We have um, sandness is about 100 metres thick. We can see these three major para sequences defined by these flooding surfaces. And we have an overall net transgressive architecture because we have Brina, non-marine, sandness, marine into increasingly marine rocks in the Egersund and Sauda uh, formation. Strongly aggradational in the central and southern parts of the area. You see these very thick stacks of the of sandstones, but we do have this overall thinning and pinch out of the deposits towards the northwest. If we look at a depositional strike profile, the architecture is very different. Obviously, then we're not seeing that pinch out because we're going across the fascist belt or along the fascist belt. But we do see some thickness changes as a function of um, thinning up onto here. This is going onto the Stavanger platform. You can see that in the seismic profile above. And also here going onto the Fleckerfjord High in the southwest as well. So going up onto this area where we see these salt diapers. We also see local preservation in the middle. Remember I said you get local preservation of offshore transition deposits below um, locally here. You can see that green sliver in here, and that might be because on the highs here on the Fleckerfield High and the Stavanger platform, wave ravinement, so during flooding, the wave ravinement at the base of the shore face is stripping off that thin lower shore face package or that offshore transition package. So we're removing it erosionally. Um, so we're amalgamating sandy reservoir fascias here and here, but we're preserving intra reservoir baffles in the deeper parts of the basin. So let's like zoom in just to finish, like let's look at three different locations to look in more detail. So we've looked at the regional stratigraphic architecture using seismic and these regional correlations. Let's look at closely spaced wells here. So I remarked on this Z salt pillow in here, the Z salt anticline. We have a well drill on the flanks and one on the on the crest. And we can see very nicely that there's very pronounced thing of the brina and it or more than halves in thickness upon the crest. And we see some subtle thinning as well in both the sandness in blue and the and the Ebersund in, in brown as well. So clearly that pillow was growing a lot during the early earliest part of the middle Jurassic and it was still growing perhaps as well into the middle to late Jurassic. This is a really nice example here of a halokinetic fold on the top of this salt structure in here. So this is part of the alpha salt wall and we see this upturn and onlap and thinning of the Brina and sandness and that's recorded in the stratigraphy which again thins over a horizontal distance of about one kilometer. So we're seeing very rapid changes in thickness. And if you look closely at the gamma ray expression in the in the sunness here, you can see we lose these high gamma ray spikes from the six well to the four well, meaning that we're probably erosionally ravening off those th finer grain rocks between the, the shore face, the upper shore face packages as we go towards the salt called high. And then we also see that really nicely here. We talked about this monocline earlier in the talk and we can see that overall seismically, the sunness in here is kind of thinning. Everything's thinning up onto that monocline because the monocline was growing during the middle to late Jurassic. And that's recorded in the stratigraphy again. And we also see this really nice amalgamation of, of sandy packages onto the high. So I won't dwell on this too long, but we can make these, um, these maps. These are not paleographic maps. There were never shore faces six kilometers wide during the middle Jurassic. I always have to say that. All these are showing you are the, the types of fascist association found beneath flooding surfaces. 
So that allows us to define these main northeast trending fascist belts, but these fascist belts were never that wide. The shore faces were probably incrementally a few kilometers wide, but they build up a sandy belt as a function of progradation, so accretion towards, in this case, the north, the northwest in here. So you know we can build this up, and we can see this this kind of um, this this kind of pattern before flooding into Unit Four into the Egerton. What all this kind of shows you is that these these regional fascist belts are present, and then there's this local superimposition of salt tectonics, giving us these local changes in in thickness and and preservation. Just three slides to finish out here. So, you know, we've done lots of other work here. This is just an advertisement as much as anything. We've done some work on the inversion here. Some of you may notice these really beautiful folds adjacent to some of the big faults along the Stavanger fault system. These are inversion structures. We did a bunch of work looking at the timing and segmentation history of the folds associated with the inversion. We did some work as well on the cellar high, so across on the opposite side of the basin to the Stavanger fault system, this is cellar high, looking at multi-phase development of the rift there and sort of lithology variations in the Zechstein. So there's carbonates on the high and halides just a few kilometers away in the low area, as you see in here, and that controls the structural style. And then we also did some work on the salt more straight up by looking at, say, the salt composition. So this is some work we did on this thing called the Epsilon diapir, where we looked at this well drill by um, Statoil which went through the, the, the neck of this diapir. So we did some work around the diapir products. And this speaks to some of the things that Ollie Duffy just showed, where we're very concerned with the intrasalt lithology and the intrasalt geometry of, of rock types. So just to summarize, we've shown you that the, you know, there's this very comp, the Egerton Basin is awesome, I love it. There's loads of great data. There's lots of uh, really interesting and difficult structural problems and stratigraphic problems. And it has this nice overlap between rifting and salt tectonics. The salt is critical in terms of dictating the rift structural style as we looked at in the first part of the talk where we focused on the Stavanger fault system. We see in terms of the sandness, there's this um, net transgressive retrogradationally to aggregationally stacked shore face succession. And that's this, you know, superimposing this wave dominated shore face, which overall built out towards the um, northwest, but locally was controlled by the evolution of faults, right, and salt diapers themselves. And yeah, the, the slip on the faults is really important in controlling the accommodation and therefore the kind of thickness and fascist patterns in the main reservoir into all of the sandness, but also potentially the secondary reservoir slightly deeper in the in the Brina formation. So thank you very much. And the last slide is a bibliography of some of the material I talked about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Very good work. Uh, also a nice presentation, the first one. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Uh, anybody out there dying to ask a question? Can't see any hands or chats. Oh, yeah, there is a hand. Let's see how I can. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, so hi, it's, uh, it's Alex here from AKVP and I have a question, you know, how, you know, you, you've shown some ex examples from the, um, from the, you know, Upper Jurassic, for example, of how the salt movements influence that, but, you know, how else do you think this work that, that you um, also proposed to do, you know, how, how else would it affect, um, you know, exploration, because that's what most of the companies are interested in. Um, what other impacts do you, do you, do you think um, new insights we'll, we'll have, not just on um, you know the positional environments. Are there other things that we we could learn potentially? Yeah, I think so. I think I mean I think there's some interesting things about the. I mean, if I combine some of the things I showed and what Ollie showed, I think there's some interesting things about how the Zechstein may act as a as a seal to the rot ligand potential if there's a source either in the Egerton Basin or whether you source from deeper in the Devonian or the Carboniferous. You know what the role the salt might play in terms of sealing things in the rot ligand. We've not really done a lot of structural mapping in the rot ligand itself. We focus mainly on the salt and above, but it could sort of some of this work. I wonder whether it could push us into looking at maybe deeper prospectivity in more marginal locations, because at the more marginal locations, the North Sea Rift, things like the Devonian Carboniferous source rocks, which otherwise would be deeply buried and overmature in other parts of the basins, may be sufficiently shallow that they could play a role in charging either subsalt or supersalt um, 
uh, prospects. Because if you get the zechstein thin enough and poor enough in halite, you can obviously migrate across salt wells uh, into shallower depths. So I think there's some interesting things there. The one thing I've not thought about at all, and Ollie's talked about that, is the Triassic. We've always ignored it because it's horrible, because it's hard to see things in it and various other things. So we've always been a bit scared, but I think now we're being forced to face that. And I feel more confident now because I think we have a better understanding of the salt tectonic framework to understand the Triassic depositional patterns in. And if I can just have one more follow up questions, have you considered looking at um, also, you know, the very shallow sediments, so very recent activation or movement along these faults, you know, that they, um, you know, above salt that appears, is that something that you could look, look into as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have had a couple of student projects working at the in the chalk and uh, looking at some amazing sort of bottom current related features in there. And then we had a student looking at geo hazards. So looking at things very, very shallow to look for gas pockets and looking at, you know, there's quite a lot of stratigraphic variability below the glaciogenic surface. Well, there's, glac there's some things in the glaciogenics, but below that, um, we had a student looking at um, geohazards, so looking at gas pockets and um, maybe potentially overpressured areas. Um, so, yeah, we can do that. And we can probably, again, we have a better understanding of the salt tectonic framework to understand how fluids may be leaking from either the supra or subsalt up via the damage zones around diapers up into the shallow. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, fantastic talk. Uh, OK, so if uh, Gabriela, are you there? Yes. Can you share can. your presentation? Sure. And I'll do a quick introduction. So Gabriela or Gabby, she's a geologist, work conducting her PhD research in salt tectonics at the Basin Research Group, Imperial College London. She obtained her bachelor's and master's degrees in Brazil, where she has also worked in the oil and gas sector as an exploration geologist for the Brazilian Petroleum Agency and for Rosneft. Her research interest focuses on sedimentary basin analysis, <laughs> including salt tectonics and the interplay of tectonics and sedimentation. So, go ahead. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, thank you all for coming to hear about the petrophysical characterization and structural styles of salt welds in the Sulphur North Sea. Um, so, the Salt weld is defined by the structure joining two rock barriers formally separated by salt. And there are three types of salt welds. Uh, a primary weld, it joins strata originally above and below autochthony salt. And secondary weld joins mini bases originally situated either side of diapirs. And a tertiary weld joins strata originally above and below alloctonal salt. And why do we care about salt welds? So it's because the rheology of remnant lithologies in welds has an impact on perspectivity. And also, salt welds are important to reconstruct the geological evolution of salt-bearing sedimentary basins. And um, we are also interested in the capacity of salt welds of controlling the flow of hazardous nuclear, nuclear waste, which is locally stored in in related diapers and also welds may also play a role in the ability of salt tectonic system to act as a co2 repositories and in our project we are aiming to answer three main questions which are related to the variability of thickness and composition of salt welds and how this relates to book thickness and composition of the original salt layer which are the factors controlling the capacity of salt welds to transmit or seal fluids, and the effects of welding on seismic velocity, density, and porosity of adjacent rocks, and how welding could impact in seismic imaging, reservoir quality, and trap definition. So today I'm going to talk about a subsurface case study in the Sulphur North Sea, aiming to answer the first question. Um, so we are going to look into the Permian Zechstein supergroup um, based on well 2D and 3D seismic data located in the UK continental shelf. Um, 
so in order to characterize the composition the composition of variability of the Zextein supergroup, we used three uh, petrophysical methods to characterize the intra Zextein lithologies. And I'm going to talk briefly about each of those three methods. So we've got a data set of 103 wells, and we started by defining um, ranges of values of gamma ray density and sonic logs um, in a cutoffs and uh, centered ar around the typical log value response for each intrasexting mythology as in this table. So for example, for halite, we define the range of 0 to 30 um, degrees of, of gamma ray density between 1.9 and 2.2 and sonic between 64 to 72. So when all the three criteria were met, um, a lithology was assigned and stored in this log that we called calculated litho. But when at least one of the, the criteria were not met, so no lithology was assigned and that zone was left blank. And these zones are highlighted here by the red arrows. So then in order to fill the gaps left by the first interpretation method, we selected 26 out of the, the 100 wells to conduct a detailed cross-plot based interpretation. And to do so, we, we used um, cross-plots of dense x-axis and sonic in the y-axis with data points colored with gamma ray values and also uh, the same cross plot with points colored with the lithologies assigned in the first interpretation method. So this could help us to identify petrophysical clusters related to each lithology. Uh, so for example, the point X was assigned in the first interpretation method based on cutoffs as halide. So the point Y that was left blank for the first interpretation method, share similar petrophysical properties of the point X, so it therefore was assigned as halide as well. So uh, the lithologies interpreted using these methods were then stored in a second lithology log that we called interpreted log. But as we dealt with a large data set, we then choose a statistical less time consuming method to interpret the remaining um, gap, um, interpretation gaps left in the remaining 77 wells. So we use a principal component analysis to, to, to conduct this interpretation. So this is um, a cluster analysis um, that divides the, the, that uses the same inputs uh, density, gamma ray, and sonic to divide the data into a given number of clusters in which a point inside each cluster shares similar petrophysical properties with other points inside the same cluster. So by dividing the data set into clusters, we were then able to use the 26 fully interpreted wells to calibrate this statistical approach and to associate each cluster with a lithology. So in this bar graph here, we can see each cluster and the, and the lithologies um, correlated to each of them um, based on the fully 26 interpreted wells. Um, then for each cluster, the higher percentage of of the, the lithology with the highest percentage was assigned to that cluster. And then the highest the percentage um, of the lithology assigned for the cluster means the calibration um, was better. Then the results of the cluster analysis um, were then um, stored in a final uh, uh, lithology log. Then we then we could finish the interpretation for the set of 103 wells. Then now that we sorted out the composition of variability of Zextein, then we are going to look into salt structural domains based on thickness maps, um, based 
on seismic interpretation of four areas in the stud area. And here we can uh, distinguish two main salt structural domains. One related to fin salt domain, which corresponds to welds or fin deposition in structural heights, or fixed salt domains that correspond to salt structures such as pillows, diapers, and walls. Um, if you look in more detail, um, the, these thickness maps for each of the areas, um, then we can see the thin salt domains highlighted in with white contours and thick salt domains highlighted in black contours. Uh, let's take the area two as an example. And let's look at a seismic line located here to see how can we can then join the composition of variability with the thickness variability of this extinct supergroup. Uh, so this is a death, migrate size, death migrated seismic line where we can see south pillows, uh, south diaper, and a primary weld here in the middle of the section. And in this, in this context, we have um, a welding occurring under a compressional regime and, this is, and the evidence for this is the presence of the buccal folds and exquisite diapers. Um, now, um, finally, joining the petrophysical interpretation with the structural styles of the of these south welds, then here we have a well section um, correspondent to this seismic section using um, these four wells that are crossing um, close close by a, a primary weld, and this one uh, crossing a south diaper, and those two crossing a south pillow. So what we can see is that the the middle upper section of the Zexton interval it's rich in mobile salts, mainly halite, and the thickness of this section is very. Uh, this this interval it's thinner in welds and thicker it's thinner in welds and thicker in in diapers. And we can also note see that there is um, a basal section um, rich in strong and uh, mechanically strong layers such as anhydride, carbonates and clastics. And this basal section has um, an almost cons constant thickness across th across the south structures. So if we zoom in in this well crossing um, the weld, let's let's see how the how the composition the, how the Zexstein composition looks like in in the south weld. So here we've got this um, basal section um, reaching carbonates and, and anhydride and minor clastics, and also a middle upper section um, rich in halite and with uh, thin layers of, of carbonates. Um, we get this pie chart with the lithology proportions in this well. We can see that we have around 39% of halite, then followed by carbonates, anhydride, clastics, and polyhalide. If we translate this information to mechanical behavior, then we can see that we have 39% of mobile salts and then 61% of other lithologies. Um, if we take this well and then compare it, and compare it with the other wells, then we can see for areas of thicker salt, we have a, a, pretty, a pretty different um, lithology distribution. So we have um, um, pro, uh, proportions much more rich in halite in areas where the exact same gross thickness is, is higher. So again, translating it to mechanical behavior, in uh, well crossing the well, we have around 39% of mobile salts, while in areas of fixed salt, we have um, between 70, 78 to 85% of mobile salts. So looking at the, big, the, the bigger picture, then we can see in this bar graph, each bar represents one of the 103 wells. 
and the pink interval represents mobile salts and, and the white interval represents um, other lithologies. In this axis, we have the, the gross uh, thickness of sextine and the, the yellow dots represents the percentage, which is in this axis, the percentage of mobile salts. So we can see there is, a in, and there is an increased trend of mobile salts as the Zexan gross thickness increases, which is highlighted by the moving average of the, of the, mob, the percentage of mobile salts, which is this dotted um, black line. So there is also an absence of mobile salts where the Zexan gross thickness is up to 150 meters. These, some of these wells are related to thin deposition in, um, in, in structural highs, and some of them are related to welds. And the thickness of the mechanically strong lithologies in the basal section of the Zexton presents just a subtle variation around the average of 180 meters. Um, so, conclusions, um, across different south structural domains, the base of Zexton is dominated by mechanically strong layers, such as in hydride carbonates and clastics. And this mechanically strong section presents subtle variations across different south structures. So, meaning either if you are crossing a weld or a diaper, the, um, the thickness of this section is it's almost the same. And this indicates um, the position of in situ character, because this is widespread um, along the basin and widespread uh, across different south structures. Um, so the mechanical behavior of this section suggests these rigid, rigid layers were not involved in salt deformation and were not removed by the salt flow, um, probably because um, it shares more, more, uh, more mechanical properties similar to the Roche ligands underlying, and then it, it could couple with the Roche ligands and it were decoupled from the, from the salt flow. And also the boundary drag um, could, uh, could uh, increase the effect of uh, keeping this, this basal section immobile. Um, so salt wells in the sulfur North Sea, they are not enriched in mechanic strong layers because they seem to be autochthonous, but they are actually depleted in mobile salts that flow into nearby diapers. So, for example, if we initiated with this primary salt layer and we thin it, then we will have um, a, a, a decreased uh, thickness of mobile salts, but the basal section will keep um, um, unchanged. Then if we keep thinning up, the, up to reaching a welding, then we will have an even lower proportion of, of mobile salts. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, a nearby diaper will inflate and will be enriched in those mobile salts that flow away from the areas being finished. Um, also, the, um, the enrichment of fixed salt domains in mobile salts is indicated by the increasing percentage of them as the Zextain gross thickness increases, and this is called in, in, in this. Uh, and this is called as differential purification um, by, by movement, the, the preferential flow of mobile salts into um, thick salt domains. And so primary wells in the area, they are composed, uh, composed predominantly by mechanically strong brittle immobile lithologists, such as carbonates and hydrate and clastics. These lithologies may be, may be more permeable and then allow existence of migration pathways between sub and super salt rocks, and they may influence how deformation generated by weld is processed and absorbed by adjacent rocks. And so, therefore, rheology and regional evaporitic deposition are key to determine salt welds composition and thickness. And so, what's next? Um, we still have um, some questions to answer about um, how salt welds, 
uh, in different uh, tectonic settings, and the capacity to transmit or seal fluids and the effects of welding in sub and super salt rocks. And to answer those questions, we are still going to conduct additional seismic interpretation, mainly in secondary welds being in effect by strike slip uh, uh, settings. And we are also conducting um, detailed field mapping in the Atlas in Morocco to document the composition and the deformation on salt welds and their surroundings. And we are going to use geomechanical modeling to understand how differential stress um, may impact um, sub and super salt uh, porosity, velocity, and uh, and reservoir qualities, quality and and trap definition. Um, so that's all. Thanks for for hearing, and I would be happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you so much and precise on time. <laughs> <laughs> so you will keep uh, working on this for a little while then? Uh, yes, Gunilla. So this is part of my um, my PhD project. Mm. And yes, yeah, so I still have more about two years or so to keep working on this project. Yeah, very. Very nice presentation and very nice presentations from all of you. Is there any Thank questions you. out there for Gabriella or Oliver or Chris? Yes, Paul? Well, um, yeah, it's um, a very, very nice presentation. Uh, I had a, a comment you. about the seismic interpretation. Um, it will be really useful if you can come up with any kind of rules about wh wh when you look at a seismic weld in the, si in the seismic, you know, whether it's likely to be permeable or not, or whether you're likely to have permeable units in contact, because that's, that's going to be a very important uh, thing for us you know, in order to make decisions about, about traps and seal. Uh Yes, def definitely. Um, so in this part of the work, we mainly focus on primer welds. And then for now, we could see that um, rheology is very important and it tends to 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 be to have um, lithologies that are more permeable. But it also depends on the regional um, uh, south stratigraphy. Because in if in this area in the exact same we have the zones one and two that are very rich in those carbonates and, and hydride and they will they will be difficult to be removed from the weld. But in maybe in another basin, if you don't have this such strong um, base in the section, they then you can have a slightly different uh, situation. But we are trying to to find some guidelines to understand. Um, how welds can um, seal or transmit fluids. And um, additionally to the composition, we are also looking how differential stress will act in the welds because there is some, um, some research suggesting there is uh, increased, increased uh, stress on welds. So on, on one hand, where you have a more permeable lithologies, you can also have a, a higher compaction or um, higher stress, maybe obliterating the, the porosity. So we still need to do those um, geomechanical modeling to, to balance um, which side is going to weight more, the composition or the additional stress. Yeah, just to, just to pick up on one thing Gabby said there, Paul, and I can send you some work that we've done on this. So we did some, so one thing that can happen is you can get a change in the polarity of the top and base salt seismic reflections as you come down into the weld location. And that's because of two, well, that's because of two things at least. One is you're juxtaposing different lithologies, of course, right? So you're actually getting response, which is a response driven by the density and velocity of the overburden and the underburden, and not necessarily anything coming from the top and the, the salt itself. And the other thing is if there's a bit of salt left in there, a few tens of meters, it depends on what the composition of that is, whether it's halite and it's acoustically faster or whether it's something else which is acoustically fairly similar to the overlying and underlying rocks. 
So we had a student a few years ago who built some synthetic forward models, seismic forward models, modeling different scenarios for different juxtapositions, for different weld compositions and different overburden and underburden compositions. And one of the things that came out of that is you can get a seismic response which reflects the fact that there's a total weld or you get down below some critical thickness of, of material in the salts. Um, so we have looked at that and it's very idealized. What you really need to do is, is to test those by having more data sets where you've got somebody in mapping in great detail around the weld and where there's a weld drilling through the weld to prove whether or not there's any salt left and if so, what type of salt it is. Does that make sense? So I think there's two bits there. One is a bunch of modeling, which you can do quite simply. And the other one is a few test cases. Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much. OK, anyone else? Any questions? Oliver, I have a question for your talk. Um, you were um, planning to have some PhD students. Uh, do you know which area you're aiming at? Is it the UK or Norway or any specific basin? Is Oliver awake? Oh no, he's fallen out. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so the, the, I mean, obviously we're, we're hunting for funding from uh, the Research Council in Norway. So the, this will be a, a Norwegian centric uh, project with possibly some uh, case studies from the UK sector as well. And we've done a lot of reconnaissance and we've identified a cluster of areas of interest. Uh, you know, so, so some of the classic highs, you know, the, the Sierra High, uh, Sella High uh, areas, uh, moving through into the Norwegian Danish basin for the mini basins. And then towards the, the edge, the, the, the uh, intersection with uh, Denmark as well, some uh, incredible salt tectonics going on uh, around there. Um, all this, I mean, essentially, and of course, there is a central ground as well. So our geographical focus, we've got some clear light to go, but we're also constrained by what people are interested in as well yeah. um, where, uh, hot areas necessarily there's flexibility on that yeah good i think you were falling out a little bit there but uh, i think we got the idea thank you so much for these uh, three talks very good and thank you for everyone who listened um I think you got a lot of feedback there for good talks. Uh, this has been recorded and Lynn will share this, I think, on the FORCE website. So this will be available and I hope our structural geology group will come back with more presentations next year. But thank you so much and uh, have a good day. Yeah, thank you.